Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Matke and you're watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota. Twice per month, I host a show about pediatric health topics where we take and answer your questions live. Our topic today is kidney transplantation in children. Joining us for this discussion are two experts in this field. The first is Dr. Mikel Prieto. Dr. Prieto is a kidney transplant surgeon at Mayo Clinic and the surgical director of the Pediatric Kidney Transplant Program. Dr. Prieto is also an assistant professor of surgery. Our second guest is Dr. Carl Kramer, a pediatric nephrologist, the division chair of pediatric nephrology, and the medical director of the Pediatric Kidney Transplant Program at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. Dr. Kramer is also an assistant professor of medicine and pediatrics. It's going to be a great discussion today, so please send in your questions under the Facebook Live video feed, and we will try our best to review them during the live broadcast today. Dr. Prieto and Dr. Kramer, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning. Welcome. And this is going to be a great discussion. I think I'm going to learn a lot from you guys about kidney transplantation. But let's get started by talking about what would be some indications or reasons why a child would need a kidney transplant. So in contrast to the adults where majority of people get a kidney transplant because of diabetes, thankfully that is a minority for mm -hmm. our pediatric population. They don't have to um, worry about all the associated other health problems with diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, the more common reasons would be that when they were born, their kidneys were not born normally. And then over time as they grow, um, their kidneys slowly fail and they essentially kind of outgrow the, the, the amount of remaining kidney tissue that they were born with. So that'd be the most, one of the most common reasons. Okay. How is that decision made um, to determine if a child should be considered for a kidney transplant or if they are still okay with their functioning kidney? So that's often based on labs tests that are done okay. um, with, with uh, your healthcare provider. Um, there's a certain sort of threshold where we start talking about kidney transplantation. Mm -hmm. And normally the kidney transplant itself does not occur until you're less than 20% kidney function. So um, it's mainly based on the, the lab values, but in kids mm -hmm. as opposed to adults, there are other things that go into consideration when making that decision. And those include the uh, things such as if your child is not growing because mm -hmm. um, uh, of the kidney failure, or um, mm -hmm. there's some other sort of unique situations where we would do a kidney transplant maybe before they get to the 20% because the kidneys are themselves are causing problems. And overall, the um, overall your life, the kid, child's lifestyle will be much better after a transplant. So. Okay. And, and the main thing is kidney transplantation is essentially one of the therapies for renal replacement therapy, mm -hmm. which means that when your kidney fails, for whatever reason, and there's many, many different reasons why the kidneys failed, mm -hmm. uh, you either need to start dialysis, which is a machine will replace your kidney uh, function or a transplant. Mm -hmm. And for everybody, but particularly for children, uh, a kidney transplant is a much better option. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the goals we try to do is to get kids with a transplant before their kidney completely fails and they need dialysis. Okay. Of course, you know, the shortage of organs sometimes is what prevent us from doing a transplant early on, but that's our goal to try to get these kids transplanted when their function is, let's say, at 15% mm -hmm. or 20%, mm -hmm. but still have a functioning kidney and we can give them a new one mm -hmm. and avoid completely the problems with dialysis. Okay. But some kids, will they have to be on dialysis before they get that kidney transplant? Um, if you do proper planning, it's a minority that will actually require dialysis. Okay. So it's kind of a, it's somewhat of a race mm -hmm. between needing to start dialysis and getting <clears throat> kidney transplantation. And if you begin that race sooner, yeah. which is what our program kind of tries to emphasize, okay then you're more likely to um, finish at the finish line with a transplant and not finish at the finish line needing dialysis. And one of the <clears throat> one of the tragedies we see and that I think this program can help with mm -hmm. is we sometimes we see children that came to us too late mm -hmm. and they're already on dialysis or they are in needing immediate dialysis when actually we could have done something earlier okay. if we had known about it and we had treated these patients earlier on. Mm -hmm. So so one big um, uh, um, message of, of something like this program would be if you have a child with progressive kidney failure mm -hmm. who at some point in the future is going to need uh, either dialysis or a transplant, go and talk to these experts early on so we can plan for a transplant on time so we can avoid dialysis altogether. 
Excellent. And and the guideline for that is around twenty five percent kidney function. Really? Yeah, okay. I think that's, that's when we start preparing. Kind of preparing is around twenty five percent. Okay. Does the child's age or their size matter in whether they are eligible for a kidney transplant? So, so the age isn't really the big determining factor. The bigger determining factor is we often will use an adult okay. kidney, mm -hmm. um, whether you're an infant or, or a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so it's mainly based on the size of the recipient or the patient mm -hmm. receiving the kidney and not necessarily the age. And the general kind of guideline is around 10 kilograms or around 22, 24 pounds is kind of mm -hmm. when we um, would consider doing the kidney transplant. But once again though, um, as we were talking about, we actually start the evaluation when you're actually closer to eight kilograms or around 16 to 18 pounds so that when you do get to that, mm -hmm. that weight, mm -hmm. you don't have to start dialysis. We can hopefully give you the transplantation. So once again, mm -hmm. trying to prepare earlier on in the process is, is a key to okay. avoiding needing dialysis. What is that process looking like when you're starting to prepare and looking into the kidney transplant? Um, so here it's a team approach, um, like many sort of other areas that do kidney transplantation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's generally about a three to four day sort of event. But for the most part, you meet many, many people. Um, and those include Dr. Creato or one of his partners, um, myself or one of um, my partners. But then also uh, there's involvement from a social worker, a dietitian a pharmacist, mm -hmm. um, and then there's some other transplant coordinator mm -hmm. and some other educational pieces. Those are kind of the standard sort of people okay. that you meet. And the reason that it's important to meet all those people is everybody has a different kind of perspective and a mm -hmm. key sort of part of the overall mm -hmm. process. And then once you've met everybody, then we all come together and, and kind of make sure that we're not missing anything that would mm -hmm. jeopardize uh, a kidney transplant. The, the whole evaluation process is geared towards mm -hmm. having not just a successful kidney transplant, but a long-term success. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here's where uh, today, today kidney transplantation, most people don't realize is very, very successful. Our success rate here at Mayo is about 100%. We haven't lost a, a kidney in many years. Mm -hmm. And and but but the thing is not the success, like leaving the hospital with a working kidney. The the, the 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 main key issue is that that kidney needs to last for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, mm -hmm. especially on a kid. We they are gonna we hope they are, have a long life and the kidney will stay with them for mm -hmm. a long time. And a lot of the factors, psychosocial factors, um, diet things, uh, following the program are so important mm -hmm. for the long term success rate that that's why during the initial evaluation we try to identify potential areas mm -hmm. for problems and try to basically address them before it's too late. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and look for resources to help with those potential concerns right. that mm -hmm. may impact the lifespan of that kidney after the transplantation. Um, well, let's talk about actually finding that, that kidney donor. Um, how, how do you guys go about that process, and is one person going to be the best <coughs> um, fit for that um, transplant? Well, <laughs> well um, first of all, um, as we all know, when, you, when it comes to kidney transplantation, mm -hmm. there's two options, a living donor kidney transplant and mm -hmm. a deceased donor kidney transplant. Okay. Uh, for the deceased donor kidney transplant, essentially when, when, when we do the full evaluation and we approve somebody for a transplant, we put them on a waiting list mm -hmm. uh, to basically when their turn comes or when we have an, an organ that matches them, then they get called mm -hmm. and they can come in for a deceased donor transplant. Now, uh, that's one option, but typically involves waiting time for that transplant, waiting on dialysis, mm -hmm. and it's not the ideal solution. Absolutely. And that's true for adults as well as for children, but particularly for children who, who need a kidney that will last them for many years, mm -hmm. we think that trying to find a living donor is by far the best option. Okay. So how does that work? Well, during the evaluation of the recipient of the child and, the, and their family, you know, we kind of do a fair amount of education about how to go about finding a living donor. Essentially, the living donor needs to be somebody that is healthy. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do a very thorough ev examination to make sure that they are not at risk for having problems and, and donors really recover quickly and they don't have any uh, long-term side effects from mm -hmm. the kidney, but, but we are not gonna let donate somebody that has medical issues that could cause themselves problems mm -hmm. or increase the risk for donation. So, and then of course, uh, we need to match the donor with the recipient in terms of things like um, blood group, 
mm-hmm. and sometimes uh, age may be important. Mm-hmm. A two-year-old should uh, ideally doesn't want to get a 70-year-old kidney, mm-hmm. and that's where where kidney pair donation, which we are doing a lot of that, comes in, where we can actually match. If you have a donor that doesn't quite match what we need to mm-hmm. do for you, we can sometimes play uh, and swap kidneys, have that kid that donor donate to somebody else while somebody else donates to your child. And I think we have a diagram of the paired kidney donation. If we could pull that up for a second. And so um, before the show, you were talking about how it's not often just with between two people. It can be with multiple different chains of people. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes. Well, that's a diagram. Of, that, that's the way we started doing these pair donations. Hey, you, you have a, an A donor and you have a B recipient. And then, and then you have another pair where there's a B donor with an A recipient. And then you can just swap kidneys. This is a simple swap. Mm-hmm. And we started doing this here in May in 2007, where we found that if somebody had an incompatible donor, maybe we could... Um, uh, we could swap kidneys. But this type of simple swap of kidneys is done less and less because now what we do is a typical chain donations which involve a lot more donors and recipients. Mm-hmm. And the way this works is that first you have typically a what's called a non-directed donor or they used to be called the Good Samaritan donor, somebody that donates to a stranger the same mm-hmm. way you donate blood. Mm-hmm. So those patients don't have a relative or a friend that needs a transplant and they can start a chain where they donate to somebody mm-hmm. and they're, that's, that's, that, that recipient's donor donates to somebody else and then we create a chain as long as we, we can mm-hmm. so that so that we get sometimes five, six, or, or 12 people transplanted. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we do that internally within Mayo Clinic. Okay. Uh, with, 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 uh, we collaborate a lot with our, the other transplant programs in Arizona and Florida. Mm-hmm. But also we are part of this National Kidney Registry, NKR, which is a national organization that works where actually 90 transplant programs work. And sometimes we ship kidneys out from Mayo and we get kidneys back okay. so that having a pool of donors and recipients looking for a swap as, as it gets bigger, you, the chances for matching and transplanting those patients that are particularly difficult to, mm-hmm. to match, um, we can do that successfully. That's fantastic. We have some um, great audience questions that I want to get to, and they're really specific with about the donor options. Can a child get an, an adult kidney as part of their transplant? Like, can a parent or maybe a good Samaritan or an unrelated donor give to a child? Correct, they can. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's, and are there that's any? Generally, the rule is generally taking the adult kidney for frequently is the okay. how big the child is. Okay, frequently is the the father or mother uh-huh. or an aunt or a relative, um, and uh, it's very nice for a small child actually to get a big kidney. Okay. They, they, that will last them longer. It's mm-hmm. like uh, putting a, a big engine in a small car. So, <laughs> so it, it really you can go really right. fast with it, right? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, grow too. so exactly. and and. and and uh, you know, it, uh, we can put an adult kidney into a one-year-old. Okay. Uh, now it, it it takes most of the abdomen, so mm-hmm. it's a it's a, it's a it's a big kidney, but but it fits, and we mm-hmm. we have done this many times with very good success, and. Uh, so that's the most typical way, but we can also do, use children, deceased donor kidneys mm-hmm. for, for ch- children. And even we are thinking of, of going further into transplanting smaller and smaller kids with children's kidneys from, from deceased donors. Okay. Also. Yeah, you have to be at least 18 to donate. Okay. That yeah, is, for a living donor. For a mm-hmm. living donor. So, but if you're a deceased donor, you don't have, yeah. have to be that age of 18. Okay. You mentioned the National Kidneys, Kidney Registry. Mm-hmm. So if people are interested in becoming the, the Good Samaritan donor or the unrelated donor, is this yeah. where they would go to register as well or are there other places? The, the, you know, the, the, there's uh, multiple. I mean, I think people that have an issue or that are interested in this topic, mm-hmm. uh, they, they should go to reliable web pages. I mean, Mayo Clinic is a, has mm-hmm. a good, a lot of information there. Another one is that, that NKR, National Kidney Registry. They do a lot of this uh, Pair donation across the country. There mm-hmm. is a very good nonprofit organization, and also their webpage has a lot of information related to this particular topic. And um, you can sign up with them. You can sign up with Mayo. You can sign up with many other centers. But it's important that people that do this, they go to, they first get their information from from a mm-hmm. reliable, trustworthy source. Because as we all know, the internet is full of also mm-hmm. anybody Absolutely. can write what they want, right? So, yeah, so you have to be careful what you read. But, but, but then go to a center where living donation is a standard practice. Okay. Um, I would say, if you want to be a, a, a donate your kidney, uh, go to a center. Uh, ask the first question is how many living donor kidney transplants you do a year in, okay. and, 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 and your center because mm-hmm. that's an important question. It is absolutely. What about um, a question from a parent? Um, um, 
And their question is, how long would a child typically have to wait on the kidney transplant list if they're waiting for a disease donor or one of those chain um, there, donor transplants? There are a lot of variables that kind okay. of go into that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's the blood type, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's um, the amount of antibodies that they have in their blood that mm -hmm. may potentially um, cause rejection in the new kidney. So there's there's quite variables, but we ha we've seen where they've only been on for a couple days, literally, wow. on the deceased donor and getting it, and sometimes it's up to a year or two, so it's highly variable. <clears throat> okay. So ch children have an advantage mm -hmm. in terms of, um, they get, when you're a child, you get more points, and so okay. you, your chances of getting transplanted sooner with a deceased donor are better than if you're an adult, mm -hmm. and this is because everybody recognizes that these kids do so much better mm -hmm. with a transplant than with being on dialysis for long term. So mm -hmm. so now, average waiting times for le an adult are three to five years, okay. that means typically three to five years on dialysis. Mm -hmm. But again, as Dr. Kramer said, it depends a little bit on your antibodies and, and your blood group and things like that, how mm -hmm. easy you are to match, essentially. Uh, for kids, it's less than that. <coughs> but still, you know, it's not unusual to see a kid waiting for a year, year and a half, two years for yeah. a transplant. So we still very much advocate for children uh, to get a, a living donor transplant. Okay. Yeah. I think families need to remember, though, if they've tried to reach out to their local resources to get a living donor at the very beginning, mm -hmm. not to lose sight of that. And if they've been on dialysis for a year, to once again kind of circle the wagon again with the community or with their resources mm -hmm. and see if there's any other potential new living donors that are available. I think sometimes <coughs> people only do it once at the very beginning and You're forget right. about it. And it can be an ongoing process trying to find living donors really while, they're, while they're on dialysis. Absolutely. So. Well, let's move on to talking about what is actually involved in the transplant. Um, can you walk us through what, the, what this um, incredible surgery looks like and what um, families can expect and prepare for? Yeah, well, the process has been very standardized mm -hmm. and, um, and um, we can do this, as I mentioned earlier, with, with very high degree of success. Now, there's a little difference if you come for a disease donor kidney transplant or a living donor transplant. Disease donor transplant ha can happen any time of the day. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you get a phone call. You say, we have an organ for you. We're going to do this transplant tomorrow evening. Mm -hmm. You come in. You get in the hospital. You get prepared. And you go to the operating room at whatever time the kidney gets into the hospital, and we can do it. Mm -hmm. right? Now, for a living donor transplant, it's completely different because, of course, you are scheduling the surgery. You have a donor, mm -hmm. a recipient. You have a plan to do this. You know exactly what you're doing. It's typically done in the morning with the, the, with the usual team. Mm -hmm. And uh, the donor and surgery usually happen, and the recipient surgery happen in two operating rooms next to each other. Mm -hmm. so, so we take the kidney out from the donor, go to the recipient, and put it in. Mm -hmm. we, uh, depends on the age of the child. Mm -hmm. A very small child would do a fairly big incision. And, and yeah, the I think we have a picture of that. Let's pull that up. And um, so for a small child, obviously, the kidney, especially if we are doing an adult kidney, mm -hmm. uh, you basically are going to take a significant part of the abdomen will be the kidney. So mm -hmm. we make a, an incision straight up and down in the middle, and the kidney usually goes on the right side. Uh, on, um, on, a, on a bigger kid, then you, we do kind of a right, what we call right lower quadrant incision. is a kind of a pocket incision in the right side and the lower abdomen. We connect the kidney to the vessels that go down to the to the right leg mm -hmm. and typically so the artery needs to be connected to the iliac artery the vein is connected to the iliac vein and, the, and then the ureter that carries the urine is connected mm -hmm. directly to the bladder let's look at the picture actually of the transplant um which or that right lower quadrant place yeah. there you go um can you sh walk us through what we're seeing here yeah, so there you can see th three kidneys, the, the two kidneys that clearly are diseased and are not functioning anymore. Mm -hmm. And then on the right side, you can see the bigger normal kidney, which has been just connected for mm -hmm. a transplant. And as you can see, you can see the uh, aorta that bifurcates and goes down to, towards the legs and the, and, the, and the cava that goes down towards the legs. And those, those arteries and veins basically are in charge of bringing the blood from the heart down to the legs and uh, vice versa, and from the legs up back to the heart so we have to connect the kidney and we do two connections one where the blood comes in in the artery in the artery and then the other one where the blood goes out in the vein and then we, of course the urine is going to come out through the ureter we use the ureter of the donor so the okay. so the, the ureter of the patient stays and we don't touch those unless there's a problem with the donor ureter let's say was injured in the donor procurement and then then you can use the the, the ureter of the patient to connect things now uh, a, a common question is uh, why don't you take the old kidneys out um, mm -hmm. um, uh, 
uh, when um, uh, when you do a transplant? And mm-hmm. the, the answer to that is, um, I usually answer with a little bit of a joke. I said, when you, when you become dead, they don't cut your ears off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you don't, uh, it, yeah. the fact that an organ doesn't work, <laughs> right. doesn't mean you need right. to take it out. It's Only not cause problems by leaving it in. E- exactly. Okay. It, it would be ec- extra surgery, bloody surgery that you don't need to mm-hmm. have. Now, it doesn't mean that in some cases we take them out. Mm-hmm. If the kidneys are infected or some patients okay. have very large polycystic kidneys mm-hmm. that are cause pain and take too much space and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's a few reasons where sometimes taking the kidneys out makes sense. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the kidneys are just not working, but they are not causing any problems. We just leave them in, put a new one in a different spot, and that's the way, is the simplest way to do it. But when we do need to take the kidneys out, though, we've actually been doing it under one procedure. So in other words, when they're putting the kidney in at the same procedure, they're actually removing the kidneys. And that saves the child having to have two, no, not only two procedures, but as you can imagine, if you remove two kidneys, you're going to need to you're, you're gonna need to go on dialysis right. before you get your kidney transplantation. So yeah. there are certain situations where Mikel and his team have been able to um, do it all under one procedure and save the child two procedures <coughs> and, and that's avoid some, dialysis. Yeah. So yeah, I that's, think that's important. Something that, that we have learned to do more and more because mm-hmm. other centers they want to do the nephrectomy first and then mm-hmm. wait and that creates a, a few additional problems. That we think that the best way to do it mm-hmm. when when it's possible and most of the time it is mm-hmm. is just to do everything at once. Yeah. So, so. decreasing recovery, probably right. infection rest, um, time in the time OR, on dialysis. time on dialysis, a whole bunch of other of yeah. other risk factors. Exactly. Well, let's um, talk about the recovery process. Some audience members are have great questions about this. What does it look like for pediatric patients versus adults? Is it similar? Or is it different? So it's it's similar in regards to um, our goal is to have the children out actually by about four days after the surgery. Discharged that, from the hospital. Discharged from the hospital. Wow. They um, do so remark, uh, remarkably well. Um, and so in regards to that, it's very similar to the adults. Okay. Um, uh, the biggest challenge I think kids have, and it's usually the older children, is they have to have a Foley catheter or a tube put into the bladder to drain the mm-hmm. urine that is now being produced by this new kidney um, to prevent back pressure onto the new kidney, which may impact how it recovers. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally that also comes out within you know three to four days after surgery. So, okay. so, so, um, so yeah, generally we... Generally, the goal is to get them out of the hospital in about four days. And they usually are f- essentially fully recovered within yeah. two, three weeks of yeah. the transplant. Wow, kind of yeah. back to their usual activities of life and stuff. Yes, w- when they start to misbehave, we know we have yeah. yeah, exactly. The parents know that, too. Yeah. Another <laughs> common question about that, though, is when can they go back to school? Yes. I think that kind of varies from person okay. to person. We had one la- this year, mm-hmm. went back at four weeks after the transplant back to school. That's how well he recovered and, and, and stuff. So. Wow, that's fantastic. So I presume that they are going to need lifelong immunosuppressive medications since they're getting somebody else's organ. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that's uh, another common question is how long will their children have to be taking mm-hmm. medications? Um, as opposed to like bone marrow where people often are able to be weaned off their immunosuppression, mm-hmm. um, 99% per, of the time, people require lifelong immunosuppression. And um, our program here is generally two medications. It's the uh, mycophenolate mofotil and then the tacrolimus are the two ones that are used most commonly and used actually, or the most too common used throughout the United States. Okay. But but uh, I like to emphasize that these kids live uh, very yes. normal lives. Mm-hmm. So they, they do have to take a few pills in the morning and mm-hmm. a few pills at night. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially the only thing that differentiates them from, from other kids. I mean, we have Olympic athletes who are, have kidney transplants. Mm-hmm. We have NBA basketball players mm-hmm. who have had kidney transplants. So, so this is not a sick child once they recover from the surgery, at least mm-hmm. uh, not, not in the common sense, but, mm-hmm. but they, they ha- can do sports, they can do a, essentially a completely normal life mm-hmm. other than being careful with making sure they take their medication and occasionally avoiding things that can be a little bit m- more risky, mm-hmm. uh, swimming in a pond that maybe, may, may, you know, maybe that's <laughs> not good for anybody <laughs> these days, but, <laughs> but they, those kind of things be uh, slightly more careful than the okay. rest of us, but essentially they have a completely normal, active, mm-hmm. uh, fun life. That's fantastic. We have an, um, a family member who's had a child who's had, a, or not a family member, an audience, excuse me, who's had a child who had a transplant but had maybe some questions about can the immunosuppressive medication cause side effects, um, specifically things like uh, weight gain or um, so, so acne, things like that. So there used to be three, th- there used to be mm-hmm. three common medications, mm-hmm. and that third medication that we didn't talk about is mm-hmm. prednisone. Okay. And that was often associated with weight gain. Okay. 
However, we do know that even those without prednisone actually have weight gain after the transplant. And part of that is because when you're in renal failure, your appetite is so suppressed. Mm -hmm. um, and then after you got a new functioning kidney, that that um, suppression of your it's a uh, sign of health. Sign of it's a sign of health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so, um, prednisone is the one I suspect they're probably talking about, okay. but. Um, it's also just yeah, having a functioning kidney option can increase your appetite. Too. Mm -hmm. There are a few side effects with the medication. Sometimes a question of dosage. Sometimes okay. patients can be on too much of mm -hmm. a medication and that causes problems. Okay. Uh, also, for example, they need to be a little more careful with, with the sun exposure okay. uh, because this is slightly higher incidence of skin cancers on transplant pa on mm -hmm. immunosuppressed patients. Mm -hmm. So, you know, making sure that you use um, block mm -hmm. uh, creams and things like that and hats and things like that, it is something that we recommend to all our patients. Mm -hmm. Which is just good skincare in general right. to wear sunscreen, exactly. and, to wear <laughs> sunscreen <laughs> and protective clothing. M most so, of the yeah. stuff we tell patients, transplant patients, we would also tell, We'd also tell everyone yeah, else, everyone right? Everyone yeah. Else, yeah. You know, exercise, make sure you're drinking enough water, those kind Healthy of things. Healthy diet. Healthy diet, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit, are there any other kind of common complications that you discuss with families um, in anticipation of the transplant? Um, so I think the two that we kind of uh, just make sure the family is aware of so there's hopefully mm -hmm. no surprises is um, rejection is the one that, that everybody thinks about. But thankfully over the past decade that it continues to drop because of our ability to find appropriate matches okay. and with our immunosuppression that we have. So that one, uh, thankfully, is less of an issue. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that is maybe a little bit more common in the pediatric population versus the adults is the fact that there's a couple viruses that can sometimes potentially cause some concerns after the transplant. Mm -hmm. But we have programs in place to monitor for those, okay. and we have strategies to, to help address them if they, if they, are, if they do develop. So. Okay. So. And, and one of the most common causes of late graft loss or, mm -hmm. or failure of the mm -hmm. transplant is non-compliance. Okay. And, and, and we see this typically in the uh, teenage years. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a classic story is a child that got transplanted at age five, has done well mm -hmm. while he was living with the parents, but now he's 17 and moves away, goes to college or mm -hmm. whatever. Suddenly the medication is running out of money, the million excuses, mm -hmm. doesn't take the immunosuppression. Sure enough, six months later shows up in our doorstep with a very severe rejection and with um, and, and, and mm -hmm. with a problem, maybe a failed kidney. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is, so we, we do a lot of education and emphasis to these kids and their families to make sure that they understand that this is one of the most common causes of kidney failure. Mm -hmm. And they need to be very much um, strategic to avoid this problem. We try to emphasize that as a team, it's a, it's a team approach to, to managing or mm -hmm. taking your medications. Even when they're 18, we still like to make sure that mm -hmm. not only does the patient participate, but also some other either family member mm -hmm. or, or sometimes when they go to college, sometimes we've recruited roommates mm -hmm. to actually kind of just help make sure the reminders and those right. sorts of things. So it's a team approach. It's not just one sort of person. Okay. Let's finish up by talking a little bit about what families can expect from the, the long-term outcomes after a kidney transplant in pediatric patients. How long are these kidneys expected to, to work for? I usually just I use the general rule that on average it's about 20 years. Okay. But we have some that have lasted 40 some years actually. Mm -hmm. So wow. once again, it's all how well do you take care of your kidney? And taking your medications is the key to that longevity. Yeah, okay. here's an area where um, the studies show that a living donor kidney does better mm -hmm. long term than a deceased donor kidney. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why we emphasize that a living donor transplant for a child is a better option. Uh, we want that kidney to last for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And in some cases, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had deceased donors that last that long, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, I, and I think people need to remember that sometimes yeah. The deceased donor it may still be a better viable option than going on to dialysis, which mm -hmm. has a lot of complications and may actually impact the lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, so, so li I agree, living is definitely the first choice. But there are certain situations where the deceased donor definitely has its benefits. So. Okay. Yeah. What um What advice or resources would you recommend to families that are going through this process? Um, so I think the national. Uh, so our the Mayo Clinic has resources on their website. Mm -hmm. um, the National Kidney Foundation provides mm -hmm. some resources. I think the center that does the transplant actually has probably the best resources. They often have handouts and pamphlets and those sorts of things. Okay. I, I would say the main thing is act early mm -hmm. and be informed and don't leave things for the last minute. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, ask a lot of questions. 
And when, when, when the kidney is failing, think of transplantation first and not dialysis first. Okay, fantastic. And they can find the Mayo Clinic resources on mayoclinic.org and Mayo Clinic Connect would be two other options. So mm-hmm. thanks so much for joining us today and sharing all your information about kidney transplantation. This was fantastic. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who watched and joined the discussion today. If we didn't get time to get your questions during the live video broadcast, we'll be sure to try to answer them afterwards. Um, you can catch the next Ask the Mayo Mom Facebook live video question and answer session on August 29th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. We'll be discussing something called nature deficit in children and why it's so important for children to be able to get outside and move their bodies and experience nature. Our guests will be Pam Meyer and Lori Forsty who is from Corey Hill Nature Center in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you so much and have a great day.